Our speaker today is Mr. Richard Grosser, and he's going to share with us his extensive expertise as a historian and also his background in the uh, national defense industry. Richard, are you here? In character, I see. Our speaker, Mr. Richard Grosser. All right, we're going to talk about the secret war. Churchill made a statement that is still quoted today that in wartime, truth is so valuable that it must be protected by a bodyguard of lies. Sorry. Well, if you go back to the Old Testament, you'll find that when Moses led the Israelites out of Egypt, they came to the land of Canaan, and he sent one man from each of the 12 tribes to spy out the land. And only one came back. His name was Caleb. And he was essentially the first intelligence agent. The first formal intelligence agency set up specifically as an intelligence agency goes back to the time of Elizabeth I, when Sir Francis Walsingham became her chief of intelligence. Spies are, of course, famous in history. We have Benedict Arnold, who was driven to spying by a uh, uh, avaricious wife, or Nathan Hale, a man who spied out of patriotism. Let's talk about real spies versus movie spies. A real spy, you see the man here on the right, he was known as Tricycle. He was one of the most important spies of the war. And he's the character that James Bond was actually modeled on. Two of the greatest intelligence agents of the Second World War, Leopold Trepper ran the infamous Red Orchestra, Richard Sorg, who operated out of Japan. The number one Western agent of the war was a Spaniard. Well, since the beginning of time, people have been trying to send messages without other people knowing what they are. One of the oldest, and I have an example up here, and you can try it yourself, is a 3,000-year-old code system that was used by the Greeks in the time of the Peloponnesian Wars. The message it makes no sense here, when you wrap it around the stick, you can say We started to get sophisticated code machines. This was one that was built in England in the 16th century. Uh, it looks pretty complicated. One of the most famous code machines, the German Enigma machine. When they designed this machine, initially, they designed into it a flaw that was so fatal that even though any message could be encoded in it, literally billions of combinations of letters, it became relatively easy to crack. A man named Alan Turing, who was one of the great geniuses of the 20th century, designed this machine called a bomb. Some of the people that were crucial to our victory in World War II are on this picture. Who knows who this woman is? Hedy Lamar. You're right. Hedy Lamar. Not not Hedley Lamar, <laughs> but Hedy Lamar. Why is she here? No, not a spy. One of the most brilliant electrical engineers in the 20th century. One of the great, greatest secrets of the war was something called Sig Sally. I'm sure none of you have ever heard of Sig Sally. But if you listen to your MP3 player today, or any digital audio device, this is where it came from. This was built by the AT&T company for the government in uh, SOE, OSS, the real spies in the world. The real, going back to Churchill's quote about the truth being so valuable. We had conquered North Africa, and you don't have to be a rocket scientist to look at a map and see where would I go from North Africa. Well, you can practically swim to Sicily. But we wanted to confuse the Germans. So the British intelligence operation formed a group called the 20 Committee. The 20 Committee, it was written in Roman numerals. So XX, it was the Double Cross Committee. They created a fictitious persona. They found a young man who had died 
of pneumonia. An entire fictitious history was created for an RAF officer, a plan of invasion that indicated that the Allies were going to invade the Balkans because Sicily was too obvious, it was prepared. A British submarine took this, the body was in a, sealed in a container on the deck of the submarine. The body was released, it duly washed up on shore in Spain. Three or four days later, the Spanish authorities informed the British that a British airman had died and washed ashore and they could claim his body and his possessions, of course, which had not been touched. They ascertained that they had, in fact, opened the briefcase and looked at the documents. As a result, the Germans were totally confused. Fusak, I'm sure you've all seen the movie uh, about Pat and how he was always getting himself into trouble. And after he had this incident of slapping the soldier, which actually he did three separate times, he was sent to Scotland to cool his heels. And they decided while he was there, we're going to make a fake army. We're getting ready for the invasion. We're going to create a fake army. So we're going to have tanks and airplanes and trucks and supply depots. They were all rubber balloons. It was made by the same people who made the Macy's floats. Radio operators generate a huge amount of simulated radio traffic. And the Germans were so convinced that Patton was America's greatest general, and they certainly weren't uh, going to waste them, and they, he was in command of something called FUSAG, which was the first U.S. Army group. It didn't exist. It never existed. We know, knew that it would be impossible to keep the location of the invasion of Europe a secret, that somebody would leak it somewhere. So how do you keep that a secret? The answer is, it, you, it leaks. Fine. But it also leaks that the invasion is going to take place in Calais, rather, or in Norway, in Denmark, in southern France, in Italy, in Greece, in the Balkans. The invasion is going to take place everywhere. So the Germans are deluged with verifiable, hard intelligence saying that the invasion is going to happen any place that it is physically possible to happen. And as a result, when it did happen, they refused to release their reinforcements because they were convinced it was a feint and that the real invasion would come in northern France. The degree that the SOE went to to confuse people, it sometimes seemed very cruel. Uh, the young lady you see here, Noor Inat Khan, a very beautiful woman, she was Indian or Anglo Indian, and she was fairly inept, and they knew she wasn't going to make a good agent. But they felt that they could use her, so she was given false information to pass on to the underground. Parachuted into France, she was captured almost immediately, horribly tortured, uh, and she did in fact give up this information and died in the process. But that was the plan from the beginning. But it was war and giving up one person to save thousands uh, was important. Leo Marx, a cocky, uh, wiseacre, young 21-year-old who when he was recruited uh, into uh, SOE, they gave him a code analysis test. And after an hour, the instructor came in and says, I'm afraid you're not going to pass. It would take our girls only 20 minutes to do this. He says, well, just give me 10 more minutes and I'll be finished. And they came back and he says, well, here, it's done. He says, well, it just took you much too long. Uh, give me the decoding card back. And he said, what decoding card? Uh, so this gentleman looked at him and he says, you mean you just broke this code in an hour and a half? He said, well, yes, isn't that what you wanted me to do? He said, you're surely not using this code. And he says, I think we need to have a discussion. <laughs> uh, and they were using this code, and he changed it completely. And he also did one of the most brilliant uh, pieces of counterintelligence uh, during the war. We, it was a strong suspicion that the Dutch underground had in fact been turned. 
And the reason he knew this is that everybody made mistakes in their coded messages. And they all missed their schedules. They were late. Uh, and they made errors. So the Dutch were always exactly on time and never made a mistake. This didn't seem right to him. He took a message and he coded it with an error. It was an error that an amateur could not solve, but professionals could. For the first time, they missed a schedule. And a day later, they responded to the message, having decoded it. At that point, they knew that the Germans had in fact turned the Dutch intelligence service. Up to May of 1943, actually up to May 15th of 1943, German U-boats were sinking as much as 600,000 tons of shipping a month. Now, on May 15th, something changed very dramatically. And from May 15th till May 31st, the Germans lost 42 U-boats, from virtually none being sunk to, in a two-week period, 42 U-boats were sunk. The Battle of Midway, William Friedman, the man who broke the Japanese code, and we had a very brilliant but eccentric code analyst in Pearl Harbor named Joseph Rochefort. And he said, please send a radio message back to Pearl Harbor in clear, unencrypted, that the water distillation equipment has broken down and you need a new pump immediately. Two days later, they decrypted a message that said, Island AY has a water shortage. That really was the end of the war uh, for them. It was that dramatic because a few days later, the brass responded to this. And as you know, we sunk four Japanese aircraft carriers and the cream of their pilots were killed. They never recovered from this. So Mr. Rochefort's reward was being demoted, sent to San Francisco and put in charge of a floating dry dock. Why? He should have gotten the Medal of Honor uh, because he made the brass look bad. Now we're moving forward, the Cold War. Now, it's funny how little twists of history occur. I lived 20-some years ago, we lived in a little village in southern Spain, near Malaga, called Churiana. And there was this older gentleman who lived there who was Finnish, uh, and his name was Rhino Halaba. And you see his picture in the middle. The Russians used one-time code systems. Well, they recovered one of these code books, partially burned, Finns recovered it, and turned it over to our top Cold War code breaker, a man named Meredith Gardner, and he discovered that the Russians had made a horrible mistake in generating these random numbers that they repeated, and they, re they read patterns that were repeatable. As a result, they took all of the messages that they had captured but weren't able to decode during the war, went back and decoded it. One of the first discoveries they made was of a Soviet agent called Antenna. That was his code name. His name was Julius Rosenberg. And so when the Rosenbergs were arrested and brought to trial, the evidence could not be used against them. It was a closely guarded secret. So there was other circumstantial evidence manufactured, some of it stretched a little, the Rosenbergs were convicted. This information uh, about Project Madonna was not made public until the 1980s. A, a Soviet mole in our intelligence service finally revealed to the Russians that we had broken that code, and that was the end of that. Where do we go from here? There's one thing that we should all be incredibly scared of. What is this beautiful picture that you're looking at? This is the internet. This is what the internet looks like globally. And it looks like if you just went, the whole thing would collapse. Well, that is in fact true. 